Follow after me. Ring, 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 ring. Okay, did okay. Not great, but we'll have more practice later. Well, welcome to worship here at Crescent Avenue and Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad you came out. You're remembering your baptism. You remember what it's like to get wet. You're remembering God's grace just flowing over you just like the rainstorm is and filling you with, hopefully, with God's peace. I'm glad that you all made it here safely. We welcome to the organ bench today uh, Pam Malver, who's filling in for Susan while she's on vacation. So it's lovely to have Pam here. Thank you so much, Pam, for stepping in. Um, but now let us turn our hearts to the worship of amazing God who creates sunshine and rain, good times and bad, a glorious world in which we may live. Let us worship our, our God. Please rise if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Listen, the Lord calls out to us, offering life. Teach, lead, turn us to your ways, O God. With our whole heart, we will turn to you and live. Please. let us together offer our prayer of confession. It is in our bulletin. Let us pray together. Merciful God, deliver us from selfishness, vain desires, and hurtful disagreements. Turn us away from the death sin inflicts and into the abundant life Christ brings. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us to forgive through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us offer our silent prayers of confession.
Amen. First, I'd like to thank you. I think in this day and age, and certainly in this time, and certainly from what we can see around us, few are the faithful hearts, the humble hearts, the hearts that put Christ first in their lives and in their schedules. To be present before God in his house in order to worship, to pray, to celebrate, to honor. This time of confession is not a time of judgment, but a time of reminding. A time that we remember Christ's sacrifice for us and his gift of reconciliation, that we might dare to be called the children of God, for that is who we are through Christ. The good news of the gospel is powerful, transformative, challenging. It takes courage to live. But embraced in its fullness, it offers peace and a bedrock upon which we can build our lives. Hear the good news of the gospel and know that it is true for you, for me, for a hurting world, for a world that is in dire need of grace and peace, who longs to hear God's word, may be spoken deep in your hearts and embraced in all its fullness. May the peace of Christ be with you all. As children of God and as disciples of Christ, we're called to share that blessed peace of Christ with another. And as Pam reminded me this morning, you know, I used to come down off the chancel. She said, do you come off the chancel to say, to share the peace? I was like, I used to. Let us rise and share the peace of Christ one with another. and minds to your word, O God. Give us understanding so that by the power of your Holy Spirit we are able to do all that you command for love's sake. Gathered in Christ's name, gathered around the word, we pray. Amen. Our Psalter reading this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. The congregation will read the bold text. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Let us listen for God's word for us today. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence 
of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in preparing my sermons, I normally read eight different commentaries. And in one of the commentaries, there's four. So, I don't know, you do the math. The purpose is I would like to hear a variety of other people's opinions and insights and thoughts on the passage just before them. I have to say that in all my years, this is the first time that I disagreed with all eight commentaries. I really think these folks missed the mark. Now that seems like a pretty arrogant thing to say, right? Learned scholars far beyond my ken who I claim are wrong. Well, the reason I say this is because in reading the Gospel of Matthew, it's very dangerous, I think, for scholars to lift out certain passages and expound upon them as if they aren't related to the other passages around them. And I think this happens here. This passage, I know personally, has been used in churches all over and throughout history, I'm sure, in times of church conflict. This is how we're going to handle this. This is how we're going to resolve this conflict. And frankly, rarely does it seem to really work well. At least, I don't think it captures what is at the heart of this passage. You see, right before this, right, Peter has identified, has named Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. And he has confessed his faith. And on that faith, that foundation, Christ builds his church. Our confession, our belief in Christ, our relationship with him. The gift that Christ has given us is the gift of reconciliation. This is what I think is truly at the heart of this passage. And in it, I think Matthew is saying to us, listen, conflicts and disagreements are going to arise, but we as a church are called to be a reconciling people, a people of grace, a people of forgiveness, a people of forbearance. But instead, at least I know in my own history, I saw this play out in such ugly ways. Good Christian people would fight with each other wanting to, demanding justice one from another. They had been done wrong and they should be addressed. And it's like, yes. But the common thing that I found in all of it was often a reluctance to admit within their own life their own sinfulness before Christ. No one is perfect. No one is without sin. No one is just as prickly as one as another. It's just that we choose not to see it. This reconciliation that they're talking about here, I think is an incredibly difficult process. But I'm reminded that it is our call as a church from 1 Corinthians 5, 16 through 19, where we read, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So let's think about that word for a bit. Reconciliation. Well, if we Google it, as so many of us do, it comes up with restore friendly relations between, cause to coexist in harmony, make or show to be compatible, make 
one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for a transaction's begun but not yet completed, as in reconciling your checking account, or to settle a disagreement, to make someone accept a disagreeable or unwelcome thing. Well, as powerful as this might be, I don't think it really gets at the heart of what the calling is as a Christian and reconciliation. First and foremost, it reflects our relationship with Christ and our humility of spirit. The world measures us by all different kinds of standards, and we fall trap to all of them. How much money we make, what our 401k looks like, what titles might be after our name, how braggable is our job in a coffee hour or tea time. How do we compare to those around us? We may even feel a sense of anxiety. Do we measure up? Can we measure up? Are we okay to be in this group? Christ has said, that's not how we look upon one another. It is not that we look upon each other with a worldly point of view, but through the eyes of Christ a reconciliation. There was some bad advice my sister got from a, high, uh, from a history teacher when she was in high school. I guess she was complaining about somebody in her class, and he said, you know, the quality you most dislike about somebody else is the one most like your own. Carried that for a few years. I thought, he must be wise. He's a history teacher. I don't think that definitely was true, though. Yes. Sometimes we can see in another a quality that we dislike in ourselves and we have a difficult time in connecting with them. But I think it's more than that. The notion of reconciling is something that needs to be taken care of carefully, prayerfully, intentionally, diligently, calmly, and with great grace. I think when we try to rush into it too quickly, we're not really reconciling one with another. We might just be burying our own feelings, afraid to bring them up. We won't look like a good Christian. But that's not true either. Or that we become far demanding in the process and lose sight of how we bring our own issues to, to the table and only see what's wrong in the other person. This leads to a great amount of anger and disagreement even further, damaging relationships even more. The world might try this work of reconciliation, but I don't think it can truly be done outside of Christ. And I know that's a bold statement, but I believe in it. Because I don't think we as individuals have that power. I don't think we're that good. But I think through Christ and opening ourselves up through prayer, to really seek a reconciliation in a situation or with a person, that takes a humility of spirit that I believe only the Holy Spirit can evoke within us. But we have to be willing to do it. Let's be honest. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Don't we just take a little bit of joy in tearing somebody else down and, and listing what's all wrong with them? Doesn't that somehow make us feel like, well, we're not like that, so maybe we're just a little bit better. Maybe we do that with other people. And then there's all of a sudden the comfort level. Yes. What is it? The best friends are the ones that forge that share a common enemy. But that's not Christian. And I think that's a hard lesson for us. And so we might feel that we give up too easily. Say, you know what? I'm never going to be able to do that. And it's true, we're not. But I believe that if we open ourselves with humility before Christ and seek that gift to reconcile ourselves with our own feelings and our own emotions, our own shortcomings, our own relationship with Christ, and then, and then, 
invite someone else into that conversation. That's where I think the power of this passage, I think that's what it's really trying to get at. It admits that maybe it cannot happen between two people. The situations that they cite are, seem to imply much larger issues the higher it goes. Certainly, if it cannot be resolved before people, and then you get other people involved in the church, well, certainly you've got triangulation going on. It's a danger of that anyway. And then before that, you've got the whole church, and you've got congregational meetings, and you've got people that leave the church, and you've got people that are angry, you've got people that are hurt, you've got people that, though they followed the letter of the law, failed to feel the spirit. And that's why I think this is so dangerous a passage. We so quickly would like to get to that point where, well, we can excommunicate, and churches have. People that haven't agreed with us. Well, now we have vindication for that. Here it is in the scripture. Treat them like the tax collectors and the Gentiles. But the problem with that is when you think about Christ's ministry to the tax collectors and the Gentiles, it is one of what? Outreach and care. It's as though Christ is saying, or Matthew is even saying, so we start again. We start again from the beginning. I would love for our church community to be sticky, where people come and they feel an attachment, that they feel at home, that they feel welcomed and honored that we take the time to learn about each other. And that each of us, each of us, would be humble enough that if there is an issue, that we don't jump quickly to how the other person is wrong. true at all levels in terms of abuse I don't recommend that somebody sit down with abuser one on one and try to reconcile the situation may not be safe I'm not saying that at all some people may question well how does reconciliation then differ from forgiveness well, I thought there was a really good breakdown of that, and I want to share that with you. Forgiveness can take place with only one person. You can forgive somebody something and not have to be in relationship with them. Reconciliation requires the involvement of at least two persons. Forgiveness is directed one way. I choose to forgive you for what you've done. Reconciliation is reciprocal, occurring both ways. That's where you really enter into a conversation. So if someone has their feelings hurt or they have an issue, that you both, both participants listen first. And what about offering an apology for something? If our words have hurt somebody, even if we didn't intend it that way, how about acknowledging that as Christians, we don't want to wound one another. We don't want to tear anybody else down. But we do want to hold each other accountable. I am not saying we just let anyone get off scot-free for things. That's not reconciliation either. Forgiveness is a decision to release the person who harmed you. Reconciliation is the effort to rejoin the person who harmed you. And again, I want to reaffirm, in cases of abuse or violence, I am not advocating anyone to go back to someone who is being abused and feel that it's incumbent upon them to reconcile with that person. That is, I do not think that is scriptural. Forgiveness is an interior discipline but reconciliation is an outward process. 
I think reconciliation is very difficult. I think it takes a lot of spiritual strength and wisdom and humility in order to begin it. There are some wise words from one of the articles that I had read that said that the journey of reconciliation is grounded first in the practice of lament. An author writes, the first language of the church in a deeply broken world is not strategy, but prayer. The journey of reconciliation is grounded in a call to see and encounter the rupture of this world so truthfully that we are literally slowed down. We are called to a space where any explanation or action is too easy, too fast, too shallow. A space where the right response can only be a desperate cry directed to God. We are called to learn the anguish cry of lament. Lament is the cry of Martin Luther King Jr. from his kitchen table in Montgomery after hearing yet another death threat. Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right, but Lord, I must confess that I am weak now. I'm faltering and I'm losing my courage. Now I am afraid. I am at the end of my powers and I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. This is just the point in time where the soul is open enough for Christ to step in, for the Holy Spirit to begin to work. Lament is not despair. It is not whining. It is not a cry into a void. Lament is a cry directed to God. It is the cry of those who see the truth of the world's deep wounds and the cost of seeking peace. It is the prayer of those who are deeply disturbed by the way things are, both between ourselves and the larger world and our communities. We are enjoined to learn to see and feel what the psalmist sees and feels and join our prayers with theirs. The journey of reconciliation is grounded in the practice of lament. But it does not end there. This passage, I know, it will quickly be read over by a number of folks across the world as it is in the lectionary. I did not choose this to preach on today. But I hope that the spirit will move in a way that a deeper understanding will be felt by all of us in this process of reconciliation, that we might truly become the disciples that Christ calls us to be, humble and open, listening and yearning to be one with one another. Paul will describe the church as the body of the church, or the body of Christ. And within that body, we all have different roles, different responsibilities, different callings. But we are all diminished when one is lost. The work of our church, of the session, of all the leaders, the members and friends of this congregation, of this body of Christ, is to reach out in reconciliation one with another, to hear each other, to listen to ourselves and our own issues, to raise them before Christ, and to truly offer this church in prayer before Christ that we might become the people that he calls us to be. That this work of reconciliation, which is ongoing, will be forevermore until we reach the eternities, is the work that we're called to. I pray that we will have the ears to hear it, both in our families, with friends, certainly in our church community and the world beyond. Not to seek to be right, but to seek to be kind, to be graceful, to be listening, to be humble, to be one with Christ, our Lord and Savior, who laid down his very life that we might be reconciled to him. That, I think, is the calling that Matthew was talking about here in this church, for his church then, and certainly for every church in these days and beyond. Amen.
as together we proclaim our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you, Pastor, um, for reading from one of Dr. King's mo most prolific sermons. I know that sermon well as a King scholar. It comes from, uh, it's called King's Experience with God. Um, you can uh, listen to it on YouTube. You can read it in um, a book called A Knock at Midnight, but it is my absolute favorite. You move me to tears, so I'm upset with you for making me get all misty-eyed this morning. Um, but church, I, I come before you this morning um, to present to you um, today's invitation to the offering. And that invitation comes from the Gospel of Amazon. That invitation comes from the Gospel of Amazon. And so in Amazon, we tend to store our passwords and our credit card so that when we need to order something, we just hit one button, one button. We don't have time for the messiness of going to get our credit card and remember passwords. But yet, when I think about it, I refused to store that same information, that same sensitive information when it came to creating an account for the Crescent Online donation. My stubbornness, my disobedience, me refusing to do that, but yet I was so willing to do it for the gospel of Amazon. One day I tried to order some gifts from Amazon. I hit send and went on my way and thought the world was right and everybody was going to get their gifts later to only find out that the gospel of Amazon failed me because my credit card was declined. It had expired. Disappointed, I had missed my timely opportunity for giving. I huffed and I puffed and I said, really God? And then God reminded me of what was my disobedience and what was my true giving opportunity. He reminded me of the Crescent Online website that I did not store my password. And then he whispered, Amazon may bring you gifts, but I am the gift. Amazon may bring you treasures, but I am the treasure. And Amazon may bring you all that you want, but I am all that you need. So thanks be to God, we have this moment in worship to acknowledge that we have all that we need in Christ Jesus. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to present our offering.
as you are able, would you please rise? Gracious and holy God, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being the gift, the treasure, and all that we will ever need. Thank you, God, for being loving and merciful, one that we can always look to be in reconciliation with. Lord, we ask now that you bless this offering, multiply it, allow it to be utilized for the further building of your kingdom on this side of glory. And when it is all said and done, we will be forever mindful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise that it is due. It is in the mighty name of Jesus we all pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like to invite Joan to come forward to for an announcement. And as she's coming forward, I want to take a moment uh, to thank someone. You know, oftentimes I try to recognize what folks are doing around campus, and I hope I don't miss anybody. But one person who's been working around campus, he comes, he doesn't tell anybody when he's here, he just goes around, and he's been cleaning up our church grounds for a while now, and it really shows the fruits of his efforts. So Leslie Fagan, just thank you so much for your work and your ministry that we're doing. We just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. So Joan. Thank you, Pastor Lynn. Uh, many of us remember the long tradition that we have of hosting or sponsoring concerts of classical music to offer it as a gift to the community. And unfortunately, because some people retired and moved away, and then the pandemic, the Crescent Concert Series, which was a cherished institution here, ceased to exist a few years ago. Uh, but we were very excited to get, a, at least I was excited, I hope Pastor Lynn was excited, she's smiling too, to get an email from uh, Cameron, no, I'm drawing Cameron, Kaze yes, Kazepsky, our former director of music, who left us to become, become a full-time student down at Peabody Institute in Baltimore a few years ago, that he and three of his musical colleagues had been working on uh, getting ready to perform Francois Couperin's, I'm gonna say it in English, Lessons of Tenebrae, or Lessons from Tenebrae. I think it would be transfer, translated either way. I'm looking towards Bill. He can shake his head one way or another. Um, and he, they would like to come up here and presented at Crescent AMU during Lent. And I know Lent's a long way away, especially when the concert is scheduled for February 20th, um, which is a Tuesday evening. Um, he and his colleagues uh, have a series, they're going to go to about six churches, where the northernmost one, Bruton Parish Church in Colonial Williamsburg, is the southernmost one. I think they're going as far west as West Virginia. But um, we're doing this under the umbrella of our Community Cultural Outreach Program, SICA, Community Cultural and Education Association. Uh, and SICA uh, has a very small board and not a lot of working committees. So I'm going to be asking you to first, wait, well, as soon as you get your 2024 calendar, mark February 20th on the calendar and plan to be here. But also we'll be asking for people to come and help us with the planning, with the pre-concert publicity, with, and on the day of the concert, uh, we need people to help with ushering. We need people beforehand to help do bull, um, programs. Uh, we would like to have a reception to meet the artists afterwards. So there's a little bit of something that might fit in everyone's comfort zone. Uh, we'll be getting back to you as we get closer to the date, um, a little bit later this fall, 
we'll try to have a committee meeting or have any inter any interested people to come and tell us what you're willing to do or can do uh, after church. So please keep it in mind. Think about how you can help. It would be wonderful. Cameron and his friends, colleagues are coming up from Baltimore to do this concert for us. No ticket sales in advance. It's going to be a free will offering. So um, hopefully we'll get a decent crowd of generous people so they haven't made the trip where they spent more on gas than they, you know, they're going to get from the plates. But we're looking forward. We're very excited about it. The other members of the SECA board had no problem saying, oh, yes, we want to do this. So uh, please join us and help. Let's have turned February 20th into a night of music for the community of Plainfield here at Crescent Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. On the 24th, a little closer to our schedule that we actually have here, um, is Membership in Evangelism is inviting you to eat cake. Not in a French Revolution kind of way, but rather to come and um, partake. We have a number of our bakers in our congregation who are sharing their gifts and their, benef you know, their wares with us, if you will. And so I invite you to come out and purchase a piece of cake. It helps support um, the filming, the recording of our worship services. So we invite you to come out and eat cake. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Am I forgetting anything? Oh, yes. If you're, if you're curious about Crescent, our building, our history, um, our community of faith, how we're trying to be sticky, Stay after church. Um, we're going to be gathering up here. I'm going to have some, some books for folks, but we're going to take a tour of the church and then go back to the guild room where BJ has provided a, um, some refreshments for us to sit and chat, learn a little bit more about you, share a little bit more about us, but a time to get together. Thank you, BJ, for that. But yeah, it's a great time. Um, it's a wonderful building, tremendous history, and we'd love to find a little bit more about you. So let us continue in worship. The psalmist says, what a privilege to carry everything that we have to God in prayer. So we come to that moment in worship where we can take what is carrying us or what we are carrying in our hearts to God in prayer, to offer that lament, even if the lament is short as, help me. Will you now bow your heads in prayer with me? Gracious and holy God, Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to come before you with our prayers to cast our concerns onto you. For no one can respond to them in a manner in which you can, Lord, for you are a loving and merciful, wonderful God who always remembers his people. So, Lord, we come before you today sharing the names of those who are dealing with health issues, for we know you to be a doctor. Lord, we bring before you Richard and Barbara, Lewis and Dennis, James and Craig, and Glenn and Druda, Roy and Uzel. Lord, we bring before you Dudley and Hank, Michael, Patrick and Vivian, we come seeking prayer and healing for Henry Ward Jr., for Lydia, for Jason, for Carol, and for our dear sister Emily. Lord, we ask for prayer for David and Kevin, George and Henry, Colleen, Ivan, William, Bill, Jim, and Alfred. Lord, we're seeking healing for Carla and Stephen. Lord, we ask for prayers for Chelsea, who is facing major surgery this Wednesday. Be in the operating room with those doctors. May your hands touch their hands. May your hands touch their minds. Continue to reinforce the skill set, the gifts that you have given them in order to be good doctors. Lord, we bring before you those who are homebound, who are not physically in church, but we know that they are here with us in spirit and possibly online. So we ask for continued prayers for Winnie, 
for Mary Jo and for Lorraine. Lord, we pray for those people who are dealing with the devocation hurricane of Idalia. Lord, give them comfort and peace, knowing that in these circumstances, you have not forgotten them, for you are always present. And Lord, we continue to pray for the members of this church who use their gifts each and every day to make sure that this is a place of peace, a place of safety, a place of worship for all those in this community, the diversity that it represents, that everyone, everyone, every shade, every gender, everyone is welcomed in your doors at Crescent. These we offer in the manner in which your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Susan and I were selecting hymns this past time. Norma happened to be in the room. And when we asked her what hymn she liked, that was the one she picked. So Norma, that one was for you. But we all want to be like that. We all want to be more like Jesus. That his, his love and his grace might pour into our hearts that we might shine out with peace and love and grace and healing. Go out from here as the children of God because that is truly who you are. Blessed by an amazing God. Reconciled to him through the love and life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who truly is our Lord and our Savior, whom we worship with all of our hearts. Go out and spread the good news of the gospel to everyone that you meet. And I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that he would cause his holy face to shine brightly upon you, and that he will fill you with the blessings of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, may be so, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.